All right, guys, I wanted to talk more about this baby formula crisis. More Perfect Union did a video on it, and it's titled, What's Really Behind the Baby Formula Shortage? So let's watch, and then we'll talk as it, as it goes along here. By now, you've heard about the shortage of baby formula wreaking havoc on the sanity of baby moms everywhere. Republicans have blamed Joe Biden, overzealous regulation, and illegal immigration. Biden administration has been sent. I love that they brought up illegal immigration. <laughs> I love that. I think they're arguing like, yeah, but if you sneak in illegally at the border, they have baby formula for you. So what's the argument? The argument is like, they shouldn't be allowed to get formula, but everybody else should be allowed to get formula. Like, obviously the answer, excuse me, the answer is to have enough formula to feed all the babies because what is it is a some like six month old baby who just crossed the border. Are you going to punish them for the sins of their parents? They don't know what country they were born in. They don't know where they're going. What do you want? Like babies at the border to starve? Is that what you want? And don't answer that question because they probably say yes. And man, does that say a lot about their character? <laughs> so I, I just I, lo I love that it just gets diverted to their pet issue of like that's yeah, immigration. Let's talk about immigration in the context of a baby formula shortage pallets of baby formula for illegal mothers and their babies. Democrats haven't exactly pushed back on the overzealous regulation narrative, with the White House this week promising they'd be cutting red tape to get more formula. Oh, I love that. I love that. So Republicans are saying it's because there's too much regulation. That's why we have this baby formula shortage. No, there was that Abbott plant, and they're going to talk about this. Babies died because the equipment was dirty and it was giving babies bacterial infections because of the the stuff that got into the formula so the answer is not to roll back the red tape and what keep selling it and let more babies die no the answer is to have the government step in and regulate it and say hey do a deep cleaning of this whole factory and all the machines and then have the government oversee the next batches of the formula now what they did is the government stepped in and shut down the plant, but then they didn't do the next logical thing, which is like, well, deep clean the plant and then let's get to it. They just sat there as the plant was shut down and maybe didn't realize that if you shut the plant down for an extended period of time, there's going to be a baby formula shortage, particularly because we have like giant monopolies in this country. There were four companies that make the formula, then it was down to two, and then one of the biggest plants was just shut down. So of course this was going to happen. But the answer isn't roll back the regulations and let the babies die of bacterial infections because the formula is tainted. God. Store shelves. The real problem, as usual, is corporate power run amok. More than 80% of the baby formula consumed in America is produced by just two companies and just a handful of factories. It's a weird state of affairs for a century old product made mostly of evaporated milk, especially when you consider the abundance of new milk options constantly vying for the latte loyalty of grownups. But many things have always been weird about the baby formula business. Abbott Labs' Similac and Mead Johnson's Enfamil have dominated the market for baby formula practically since it was invented. In the 1970s, a huge scandal over what activists correctly dubbed a corporate conspiracy to hook billions of innocent babies on liquefied junk food drove the third big player, Nestle, out of the business for decades. <laughs> and in the 90s, the fourth big baby formula player, SMA, got out of formula manufacturing too. Soon enough, the price of a quart of the stuff surged to 10 and then 20 bucks. There's also one primary mega buyer of baby formula, the federal government. The USDA's Women, Infants, and Children Supplemental Nutrition Program, which distributes free formula to families under certain income thresholds, buys half of the formula consumed in America. That's another big driver of monopolization. It's a pretty reliable rule of thumb. The government business goes to those with the most entrenched lobbyists. Not coincidentally, the dominant formula maker, Abbott Labs, whose Similac brand controls 43% of the market, was also, until recently, the monopoly producer of rapid COVID tests. <laughs> Abbott isn't your run-of-the-mill bread price-fixing monopolist. Last year, it joined the ranks of Dividend Kings, 39 members of the S&P 500 index that increased their payouts to shareholders for at least 50 consecutive years in a row. Wow. Abbott has paid shareholders nearly $10 million in dividends since 2019 while dumping another $5.7 billion into stock buybacks. Oh. The old stock buybacks rear their ugly head again. That used to be illegal before Ronald Reagan. Before the 1980s, that was illegal. And now stock buybacks are... You know, very, very common practice. Seeing in the lofty company of the dividend kings requires Abbott to send out bigger and bigger checks to investors with each passing year, which in turn requires them to generate bigger and bigger profits. That's not easy. Abbott's operating profit margins are 20%, more than twice as high as the average blue chip S&P 500 stock. But as two recent stories that have emerged from Abbott's factory floors illustrate, maintaining those oligopolistic margins sometimes involves manipulating supply and demand in ways that can hurt both workers and consumers. 
Over the summer, the New York Times published a detailed account of Abbott ordering temp workers at a factory in Maine to destroy more than 8.6 million perfectly good COVID tests because cases were falling and they didn't want to risk an oversupply driving price tags down. Which what an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. You want to talk, and Richard Wolff talks about this all the time, like perverse incentive structures with capitalism. I don't know how anybody could look at that and say, yeah, we've developed like the most efficient system to deal with a pandemic or a time of crisis. Destroying COVID tests because cases were falling and so they want to flood the market and have too much supply driving down the prices. That might hurt their bottom line, so they have to do it. It's unbelievable. I'm pretty sure the more moral and ethical thing to do, the more intelligent thing to do for the health of broader society is to not destroy millions and millions of COVID tests. And then we, and then of course, I'm sure you guys remember when we had the next wave for a while, there was a shortage of tests again. It, it, our system is such a joke. It's such a joke. Just months before the pandemic at Abbott's main formula factory in Sturgis, Michigan, Abbott managers were so determined to meet their metrics that they refused to throw away at least one batch of formula in which multiple samples tested positive for potentially infectious microorganisms. That account. Wow. Literally risking babies getting poisoned, getting I infections, because you need to continue to make more profit. Wow, man. I'm at a loss for words. It's rare, but it's happening. I'm at a loss for words comes from a 34 page whistleblower account mailed to the FDA in October that ultimately led to the February closure that touched off the formula apocalypse. It's not clear why it took so long for the FDA to investigate the report, which describes a toxic corporate culture that turned a blind eye towards serious breaches of the most basic regulatory requirements and major and serious breakdown in the controls designed to ensure that the product met specification. But the report could almost be renamed how to be a dividend king, because for the most wow. part, these breakdowns occurred because following the rules would have cost money. There are accepted processes for testing the seams and the cans to make sure bad stuff stays out of baby bottles. But management gains those tests by testing the cans before they're actually filled with powder. There are protocols for reporting the results of tests. They test the cans before they have the product in it to game the system. To be like, yep, nope, nothing wrong with this batch. I'm, you couldn't make this stuff up if you tried, man. Holy shit, this is crazy formula samples for microorganisms, but the whistleblower noticed nine reports that are straight up missing any test results at all, despite being signed off on by multiple supervisors. And when management detected micros in a batch of formula in 2019, they devised a BS workaround to the normal protocol so they didn't have to dump more than a small fraction of the batch, salvaging hundreds of potentially tainted cans of formula and fudging the books so FDA inspectors wouldn't catch on. They didn't. The source of the micro- what, What's the proper punishment for a company acting this egregiously? What's the proper punishment? There was a similar case that happened in China, and they put the, the business owners to death. They put the executives to death. Oh, you're going to prioritize your profits over the health of babies, and maybe murder babies in the process. Huh. Seems like perhaps you're guilty of murder, or at the very least, manslaughter. But really, it's not just manslaughter. It's not just a whoopsie. They know what they're doing has risks. This is wild, man. This is wild. I mean, they're rolling the dice with the health of babies just to make more profit. There's so many things you could do to fix this and address this. You could fix this from a number of different angles, too. You could just have the government get more involved, do stronger regulations, have them oversee this stuff directly because now they have a track record of, you know, fudging the process and putting people at risk. So that could happen. Um, or you could break up the monopolies and introduce uh, more competition. It, you should probably do a mix of both. Break up the monopolies, introduce more competition, and also have stricter government oversight and regulation, and also have a system set up where if you do have to shut down one of the plants, like they did here, immediately invoke the Defense Production Act to make more baby formula. And so that's what Biden's doing now. He's, he's bringing in baby form formula from Europe, which actually they have stricter health standards and regulations, so that's even better formula. They're bringing that in, they're flying that in, while also invoking the Defense Production Act. Look, deep clean the factory and then get to work, dog, and have a, you know, have a watchdog keeping their eye on it to make sure that the batches are safe. The way they were acting is beyond egregious. It is beyond criminal. I mean, heads should roll over this.
Micros was old equipment that has needed repairing since maybe 2012, but the incentive structure doesn't permit such extravagances. The whistleblower discovered a pattern of supervisors blaming workers in official investigations of the root causes of quality control issues caused by known mechanical failures. This tracks with Abbott's apparent unwillingness, shared by so many modern monopolists, to invest in modernizing its plans. Like most S&P 500 companies, Abbott spent more on stock buybacks than capital expenditures last year. Over the weekend, an Abbott spokesperson <sighs> had the gall to suggest that the company- Also ban stock buybacks immediately. Look, you just have to change the incentive structure with a lot of these things. Are there some areas where the profit motive doesn't bother me at all? Of course. I've, you know, I've given this example before, but the cars that came out of the Soviet Union were absolute trash. Because there was no competition, the government was making it, they came up with a goofy design and just created a whole bunch of those cars. It was terrible. So, you know, when it comes to cars, yeah, the profit motive and capitalism and innovation spurred a variety of different vehicles with a variety of different features, and they're better. Now, you need regulation, you know, you have to wear the seatbelts, so let's mandate airbags and whatnot. But the private market worked pretty well in that sense. Um, to when it comes to making video games or whatever, or sneakers, like, yeah, I'm fine with competition. Uh, I'm fine with the profit motive. It, it, it doesn't drive me crazy. But when you look at some the, the necessities of life, the basics, healthcare, education, baby formula, clearly, look, just leaving it up to the private market. Just leaving up to the private market. Look at what you get. Look at what you get with the perverse incentive structure. They are literally prioritizing profits over the health of babies, and now a couple babies are dead as a result of it. And by the way, we're lucky more didn't die, based on what we're learning here. They had been vindicated by CDC tests that had failed to find conclusive evidence linking the Cronobacter strains that had sickened four Similac-fed infants last fall and killed two. Total bullshit. Total bullshit. The Cronobacter strains found in the Sturgis plant in February. It's not because inspectors didn't find Cronobacter at the site. They found five separate strains of it. Just none that was an exact match to the strains believed to infected the infants back in the fall. So you see how Weasley they're being too? They're trying to say, no, we're not responsible for it because it wasn't a strain that was found in the plant. Even though you see the million ways in which they're cutting corners and which they're basically hiding the fact that you have tainted batches and they're selling it anyway. Uh... But this is not a malpractice trial. The infant deaths were certainly a factor in the agency's decision to temporarily shut down the plant. But inspectors' exposure to what the whistleblower repeatedly described as a total breakdown of quality assurance and record-keeping protocols was likely a more serious one. Both Abbott and the FDA have promised the Sturgis plant will reopen within weeks, but also that relief on store shelves is realistically two months away. While the formula apocalypse should have been a major boon for Similac's main competitor, Enfamil, the week before the FDA shut down the Similac plant, Enfamil's British parent company announced that it was putting the formula business up for sale because the formula racket had failed to produce the sales growth it anticipated. Women simply weren't having enough babies. I can't imagine why. And that's the thing about dividend kings and the spreadsheet wizards that engineer their stock market success. The idea of rising to a challenge, even if there's plenty of money in it for them, simply does not compute. All they know how to do is slash costs, jack up prices, and rain cash down on shareholders. The good news is that one of the most obvious solutions for the great formula apocalypse of 2022 would also go a long way toward solving a vast array of America's other problems, from understaffed emergency rooms to runaway inflation to airplanes inexplicably programmed to dive into the ground. Ban stock buybacks and restrict dividends on companies with a documented track record of flouting regulators and compromising safety standards. Based. Because America has a lot of problems and raining trillions of dollars down on shareholders for an umpteenth year in a row ain't gonna solve any of them. Wow. Yet again, fantastic work from More Perfect Union. You know, now you guys have a much better idea about the ins and outs of what happened with this baby formula shortage and the crisis. Um, look, I know conservatives often talk about, like, we believe in law and order. Um, in many ways, they don't. They don't believe in law and order. In many ways, I do believe in law and order. Like, when they say law and order, they mean, like, let's enforce the drug war more strictly and throw people in prison and... Uh, throw away the key, lock people in prison and throw away the key. That's what, when they talk about law and order, that's what they mean. When I talk about law and order, I talk about like, let's actually enforce and believe in international law, right? Like George W. Bush and Dick Cheney should be in jail because they're war criminals. That's the kind type of law and order I believe in. And uh, go after the corporate criminals here. Put them behind bars. That's the kind of law and order I believe in. I'm on the side of law and order. For things that are actually crimes, there should actually be punishment. And this is one of those instances right here. You're just gonna, these executives are going to skate, of course. Of course they're going to skate, and they're going to get more giant bonuses, and they're going to be fine. But look at the decisions that came out of this company. Broken system, man. Broken system, and I think that's obvious. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop, and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.